Laporta drives it deep left field. Cut this off. It's over. Indians win it 7 to 6. Welcome to Fastball and Finance with your host, Matt Laporta. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining uh, Matt Laporta of Fastball and Finance. And we have a great guest today, uh, Travis Hafner, who's also a really good friend of mine. Travis, thanks for being on the show with us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. This guy is probably one of my uh, most favorite teammates that I've ever played with. Um, you know, Travis is probably one of the, the most humble guys that I've known and played with and, and that has had the success that he's had. Um, it's, it's really been truly a blessing, man, and an honor to, to uh, get to know you and your family and, and watch you play and play with you. And so, again, uh, we're grateful to, to have you on the show tonight. Um, so I, I know you're from North Dakota. I got to go. There's not a whole lot of baseball, I, I wouldn't imagine, being played up there, especially maybe when you were kind of coming through. Is, would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. Um, so I didn't play high school baseball. I just played Legion baseball. And um, I remember one year uh, it snowed quite a ways into the spring. And I, I think people are going into the state tournaments with like four and one records. Four and one. <laughs> Basically, season started for like the playoffs <laughs> I, I mean I'm from I'm a Florida guy I've never been in the snow like that so what do you do when it's snowing and how do you how do you how would you even prepare and to prep to play baseball yeah I mean it's just you're in the gym playing catch and you're hitting BP in the cage so there's not really a whole lot you can do um yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess you go outside when it's 30 degrees and that, that's your summer, so you go out and start playing. No, thank you. Man, that is uh, – that's crazy. Yeah, that's so not, I, not how baseball is meant to be played, that's for sure. Whew, talk about being stiff, man. <laughs> Blowing out obliques and all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, you, you were you, – so your high school didn't have a baseball team. And um, – you know, I also, you know, kind of with the size, maybe our viewers don't know how big you are, but I mean, you got to be what, 6'4 ish, 6'5 ish, you know, 250, 260. You know, from the looks of you, I would think you would play football. Is football a big sport in North Dakota there? Yeah, I mean, they have nine man and 11 man, and it's pretty popular up there. Um, yeah, high school football is big, and high school basketball is big. Those are probably the two big sports up there. Um, football we actually co-opt with about four other high schools to make a football team <laughs> um, it was crazy yeah so just being from a high school of like 24 kids I mean you just combined with four other schools to make a football team but um, growing up on a farm fall was our busy season and harvest season so my dad always had me uh, help out with harvest um, and that was kind of like an everyday after school thing so I never played football. How about that? So how did you get into baseball? It was something that I always liked. Um, I collected baseball cards. I watched baseball. We had like a satellite dish, which is crazy to say you had a satellite dish. People nowadays would be like, what's a satellite dish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would, you'd like have like satellite G4 and you'd like the actual <laughs> dish would like rotate and turn. Oh, yeah. I remember those. <laughs> But uh, so we got like the Orioles station and the Braves station. So I grew up watching like Cal Ripken and uh, Eddie Murray with the Orioles and some of the Braves guys. And the crime uh, dog. I was like baseball. I would, I would always go in my backyard and hit rocks. And I don't know, just something about baseball that drew me to it. How about that? Yeah, that's that's fascinating. You know, you, you know, and it, it's it just goes to show you it doesn't you know, you don't have to be from a big city or a place where everybody's noticing you to get to the big leagues. So a lot of people don't know this. Um, and I, I think I'm, hopefully I'm correct on this, but you were the valedictorian of your class. So right. you're a pretty smart guy, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we had eight kids in my class, so my chances were better than most people's. <laughs> chance to make it. 
Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to let you say that. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be the one to say that. But uh, yeah, but, but still, I tell people I finished in the top ten of my class. <laughs> Out of eight kids, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's that's funny, and that explains why. Uh, I think that explains why you beat me uh, in chess, uh, and I'm probably not much of a match. It seems like right now. Well, chess isn't like purely like book smart um there's some street smarts in there which i definitely have you there um, <laughs> i enjoy making traps and watch you fall, you know walk into them oh uh, i do i do walk right into them i think i'm like this guy's just playing with me right now <laughs> oh man sometimes, so sometimes you just throw the bait out there and it's it's almost like fish and seven like you'll throw the bait out there and you kind of like pulling the string along and sooner or later you're going to bite. Yeah. Hey, so some of the, some of the listeners are going to go, who's seven? What, what's seven? You know, meaning referring to me, explain to uh, the listeners why you call me seven and you might not really know. It just started happening. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think about it. Uh, was it just that? Was it that your number, or was that how many Hall of Fames you're in? <laughs> yeah, that was my number. But uh, I think it, I wonder if it was. Remember Mike Redman? He, I think he would always yell at me like, "Go get you a sandwich, seven, and, you know, or something after batting practice." <laughs> you, you know, in his uh, old Red's voice, uh, and then I think it just kind of maybe stuck with you. Yeah, you've been seven now for like seven years. Yeah, it's been a while. I think it'll always be seven years, right? I don't think yeah. we'll change it from there. So when you were growing up and you're in high school, did you work out much? Or was it just, I mean, you were just so strong from from farming? Um, I always like to play sports. Like I, I practiced a lot of basketball. Like I always go and shoot hoops. And I'd always go practice baseball. So I was just playing a lot of sports. I really didn't start working out until my senior year. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't even know how to work out. I just started lifting a little bit. But um, but now you're an animal. Now I'm an animal, yep. Uh, baseball, basketball, and track were my three sports that I did in, in high school. And I really didn't start working out until we got to college. And then when we got to college, um, our coaches there, like, they – showed us a whole nother level of work ethic. So oh, that, was wow. big, that was a big adjustment. So you went to school, uh, JUCO in Arkansas, right? Uh, it was our Kansas City, Kansas in Southern Kansas. Oh, it was, uh, it was in Kansas. Valley County. Yep. Got it. Got it. So how many years did you play there and what was your experience like at, at a JUCO? I know some parents question, well, should my kid go to JUCO or should he go to professional baseball? Like, what would your advice be, you know, you know, the pro route compared to JUCO or vice versa? Um, so I went to two years of junior college, um, and I loved it. I had so many options um, by going there. I wasn't highly recruited coming out of North Dakota. I didn't really have much in, the, in line or in terms of four-year offers, so I went to JUCO. After JUCO, I had options to go to a Division One school. I signed with Texas Tech but ultimately didn't go there. And then I also had um, pro teams looking at me and I got drafted by the Texas Rangers. Yeah. So kind of a rule of thumb that I tell kids, if you're, if you're um, coming out of high school, I would want to be minimum a top 10 round pick. Um, and probably the same out of junior college. Um, and then, you know, once you got to a four year, you know, and you've been there three or four years, then you can sign and give it, get your chance to play. But I feel like unless, unless an organization invests a top 10 round picking you, um, it's too easy for them to release you if you have a bad year. But if they have a little something invested in you being a top 10 round pick, they're going to give you three or four years and multiple chances. They're going to send you to, to instructional league. And that's going to be your, your best route to have multiple chances to develop um, and to you know to to have a legitimate chance to become a big league player. Yeah, no, that, that that's great advice. That's that's really good. So you get drafted. What in, in what year? What year is that? Two thousand and two, three. Uh, I got drafted in ninety seven in the thirty first round after my freshman year, 
and then I went back um, for my sophomore year, and then I signed right before the draft my sophomore year. Gotcha. I gotcha. So you're playing in the Rangers organization uh, down in good old Port Charlotte. Were you ever down there? Almost seven. Oh, <laughs> about six years, I think we were there. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'm pretty sure I remember watching you play in s somewhere down there, whatever, whatever it was, the big leagues or in the backfield minor league games. Um, yeah, we used to live, I mean, we only used to live like five minutes from there. So we'd always go to the games and get all the home run balls to use to practice with. Try to get, you know, try to make it out there where you guys were at. Yeah. No, it was it was cool even um when I first signed I went to rookie ball. So Port Charlotte has a Gulf Coast rookie ball team and then the Florida State League team, which is high A, they play at night. <clears throat> so you're kind of in the same complex at different spots and at different times. But it was cool as an eighteen year old, eighteen to twenty year old to look over and see these like kids that are twenty two, twenty three, you know, pretty much two or three years ab above you or more advanced than you and kind of just see what that progression looks like and you can mm -hmm. kind of see like okay this is the level that I need to get to to at least get to high a and then above that you know you have double a triple a and the big league so it was cool to just kind of have those older guys that you could I mean much like the same you did in high school we would go watch those Florida State League games just to get a feel for what better competition was like yeah definitely what was your experience like when you were you know, being in Port Charlotte and then just being kind of that overall in that minor league experience. Um, so I remember, like, like I love baseball. So I think of, I signed and then I went out and played. And after two weeks, they threw like a paycheck for, you know, a couple hundred bucks on my chair. And I thought it was like the greatest thing ever, like, <laughs> felt like, like stealing money. Like, wow, they just paid me to play baseball. Um so, you know, it was great. Like, you develop some great friendships. Um, you know, you, you always hear the horror stories about traveling on a bus, but it's really not that bad. It's fun. You're, like, playing baseball every night. You're going around and seeing seeing the country and seeing different ballparks. And, you know, minor league stadiums entertain pretty well. So, you know, you're, you're playing in front of a couple thousand people every night. And, shoot, it's great. Like, it's uh, – I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I think I think minor league baseball gets a bad reputation. Um, I I always enjoyed it too. I mean, sometimes some of the bus rides might have got a little long, but outside of that, I mean, especially some of the fields nowadays are so nice. It's like, man, this is you know. I guess back in the day it used to be terrible, but but not not so much now. Yeah, the, the fields have come a long way, and um, now you'll see state-of-the-art fields that hold like six to eight thousand fans mm -hmm. in phenomenal venues yeah man so at what point in your career uh did you develop the name pronk would have been um uh so i spent my first two months in the big leagues with texas and then i got traded to cleveland and I got to spring training with Cleveland. It would have been my going into my first full season or my rookie season. And uh, some of the guys said, when I was playing with Texas, they were talking on the bench, like, what do you think of this Hafner kid? And they're like, he's kind of a project. And then, uh, so a couple of people called me project. And then a couple of people just called me like big donkey. Yeah. Just being a big guy. And uh, so we had some guys call me pronky, some, uh, our project and some call me donkey and we just put them together for pronky and then shorten it up to pronk. I mean, I mean, how cool is that? Like to have such a nickname that is so prominent. I mean, for God's sakes, you were getting, you know, later on in your career, you were getting, you were getting candy bars made after you. And, and, you know, and by the way, I think I had one of those candy bars that you gave me. It might've been 10 years old, but, but I had one when we played together in Cleveland they weren't bad. Devin, I wouldn't give you a candy bar that was over eight years old. <laughs> I appreciate that. But yeah, that was, I got a kick out of that, man. Do you still have any of your pronk bars out there? I think we have some of them. I mean, they discontinued them. And I can't believe they discontinued them. Mally's, Mally's chocolate um, had like a crunch bar. Mm -hmm. And then essentially the crunch bar just became the pronk bar. 
And then once they discontinue that, it's just back to the crunch bar right now. But remember they, my agent called and said like, Hey, this, uh, this candy bar or this chocolate company wants to do a, a candy bar. And I was like, man, I want to try it. I want to make up the recipe and do all this stuff. And my agent was just like, I think they're just, they got the candy bar made. It's just, do you want a candy bar? Um, <laughs> I, tried it. I tried it and it's legitimately like the best candy bar I've ever had in my life. So I was like, okay, well, this is perfect. I would, you know, what do I know about making a candy bar? So yeah. Is that, is that company still in business? Mally? Yeah, is it Mally's? Mally's chocolate. It's yeah. uh, like, legitimately some of the best like chocolates and candies you've ever had in your life are they up there in cleveland yep i have yeah. to get some get some uh let's see if we can get pull off the old pronk bars see if they can uh get a couple made for us reminisce i think all they'd have to do is just throw a wrapper on the crunch bar <laughs> but I mean, like as far as like christmas gifts and stuff they're phenomenal they're so good yeah that's a good idea i'll have to check them out man i'm a big uh i'm a big big chocolate fan here um so is this true too i don't know did you have some like beef jerky too yeah you have beef jerky i mean this guy's got a he's got a whole supermarket going on right now yeah i mean i was uh really into targeting like health food <laughs> chocolate beef jerky <laughs> uh, i didn't see any beef jerky sticks what happened to those um they didn't, they didn't make it out of production too much? I think, like, one specific grocery store sold them. Mm -hmm. So they they weren't out there that much. And then, I mean, I would I would get, like, kind of a limited supply, and then I'd always take them into the clubhouse, and everybody would, like, eat it really quick. Yeah. You had fat teammates like like me coming in there crushing your candy bars and Slim Jims. Right. But uh, <laughs> the beef jerky wasn't bad. I mean, it was solid. Yeah, that's awesome, man. No, that's that's good stuff. So you got traded in two thousand two to the Indians, right? Is that right? Yeah, the off the off season. Yeah, so it have been two thousand two in the off season. So you play with them, and then kind of fast forward to two thousand five. You have a pretty incredible year, right? You finish. Am I am I accurate here? You finished fifth in the MVP voting. Um, I'm not sure exactly what year, but five and 2005 and 2006 were both good years. Like you dominate, yeah, you were dominating, man. I think 2006, you finished in the eighth, you, you know, in MVP voting. I mean, 2006, I would, did you feel like your 2006 season was better than your 2005 season outside of being hurt in 2006? Yeah, so 2006, I got hurt like September 1st. I got beaten and broke my hands. So I missed the last month of the season. Um, but 2006 was a better season, but our team also wasn't as good. Uh, 2005, we were in the playoff hunt until essentially it was like the last game of the year. Yeah. And I had a good second half, so that's probably where the little higher finish in the voting came in. Gotcha. I mean, so I, I kind of want to run over your 2006 season, man, because, I, I mean, I'm, I was looking at the stuff today and I just – I was mind blowing. I mean, you know, you had you had a hundred walks. I mean, being a power hitter, that's a that's I think that's a lot of walks. You had 117 RBIs, you had 42 home runs, your on base percentage was 439. You know, I think you had total bases are 299. I mean, and you finished 308. You finished you know, um, yeah, 308. I mean, that's that's incredible. I mean, that's unbelievable, that that kind of season. And that's the season you had you had six or you had five grand slams before the all star break in yeah. 06. Yeah. I mean, walk us through that. Were you even paying did you even know that was going on that you had those many that many grand slams, or you just kind of like just out there hitting, you know, not even thinking about it? Yeah, a, a lot of times you have no idea of anything until like you tie something or beat something. And then usually after the game, um, when you're speaking with the media, they'll bring it to your attention. And then they'll always ask, did you have any idea? Which, of course, you don't like unless you were to have like a random baseball almanac book and just, <laughs> you know, 
be looking up every random stat. Um, but yeah, I think once I got to four, maybe that tied it. So then at four, I was aware of it. Um, and then uh, once I hit five and they told me that broke it and then I knew that six was the record. So it was cool to tie that. And it's just, it was really just a completely freak thing. Like you can't, you can't ever expect to, you know, if you have one grand slam in a season, you're usually, yeah. that's usually pretty good. So it was just, it was just one of those things where, I mean, everything just lined up perfectly and, you know, it's not something that you would ever duplicate again in your career. Yeah. I mean, you hit six grand slams. I mean, that's, I mean, that's insane. You know, I mean, you, you joined a couple of hall of famers, Ernie Banks and, and, uh, uh, Don Mattingly and Jim Gentile, I think for tying it or are they, they're not tied with you at six now, right? I think Mattingly, uh, me and Mattingly are at six. And okay. then I think some of those, uh, hall of famers that you mentioned definitely have more career, um, grand slams, quite a few. I'm just not sure single season wise. The only, the only person I'm really aware of single season wise is Mattingly. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I just think that's that's uh, that's incredible, bro. Um, so, you, you know, you get you, you have that year, and then you get signed again in two thousand and seven, right? Yep. So, what, walk us through that, right? Like, what was that moment like? You know, you've busted your butt, you've worked so hard, um, and, and kind of that that fruit of your labors is paying off right now with a contract, you know, is a, is a nice contract. And, you know, what was your thought process going in? Like, you know, did you ever think you'd get to that point? Um, and then what was the first thing you bought with the money? Well, um, I don't know. Like I never really, like my goal wasn't to play baseball to be able to get a contract or to get any money. Like your goal is just, I want to, play with the best players in the world and have a chance to win a world series. So <clears throat> that was always kind of my motivation. So it was just like, once, once you get like a contract offer, I mean, even my first contract, um, it was, it didn't even seem real to look at like the paper and say like, wow, they're offering me this much money to play baseball. And then at one point I turned it down and, like, you're just like, I can't believe I just turned down that amount of money. <laughs> Dad would slap me right now if he knew that I did this. <laughs> um, but I guess the negotiation part can be, uh, uh, that can be really stressful. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, you have some people in your ear saying, there's no way you can do that. And then you're like, man, how do I turn down this amount of money? And, you know, it's just, it's, it's not as easy you know, once you're in it, as a as opposed to out, on the outside looking in, it seems like, oh, that's a no-brainer. But you get a lot of people pulling you in a lot of different directions in those uh, in those negotiations. But ultimately, I mean, it's it's such a blessing to be able to um, to make a good living playing playing baseball. Yeah, yeah, and you played it so well. I mean, I, I would have to say, like, really, you know it was you and big poppy man that kind of defined what a dh role looks like you, you know you guys you guys did it so well and for so long and, and so uh you, you know that that's something that stands out a lot to me so you've had some success with the indians and they finally i think in 2000 and maybe seven they uh maybe it was 2006 they name a section of the stadium after you pronkville Pronkville, yeah. I mean, I mean, come, I mean, this guy's got candy bars, Slim Jims, Pronkville. I mean, this guy's a legend in Ohio. Well, it was the upper deck. It wasn't like the good seat. <laughs> yeah, but you that's where you hit them. You're hitting them in the <laughs> upper deck, bro. Uh, no, that, that was really cool. I mean, uh, that, I mean, that was awesome by the Indians to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really cool. And it was so cool. I mean, I think it was still there when I played. It was, I mean, it was still up when I was there playing. 
after my yeah, I think eventually it was like, well, you haven't hit one up there in four years. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take it down. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, I think the joke was after a few years that they needed to name like the the front row like the front row just over the fence like that was the new front row the little fence scraper. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's awesome! Um, and so, you know, what was your best experience playing in the big leagues? Your most memorable experience of it? Probably oh seven. Um, that was the only year I got to experience the playoffs. So just kind of going through that. And um, I mean, it's, it's fun to watch like the playoffs are going on right now. Um, but just how draining those games are. Like, I mean, you can, you know, play two weeks in a row in the regular season and it's no big deal, but like each playoff game, like you're so focused on every pitch and so much is riding on every pitch that, I mean, you're just exhausted. Like, during the playoffs, I'd be waking up at noon, you know, and normally you're up at 9 a.m., but you're just, you're so exhausted and so mentally beat. It just takes like that long to recover. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't imagine playing in the playoffs. I think that would be so much fun. I feel like every year I watch it with like excitement, you know, it's especially because you know how hard the guys work to get to that point and how long the season is and how mentally tough you got to be to make it that far. <laughs> so it's uh I can't imagine actually playing in 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 a playoff in the big leagues. Um you, you know what who was who was one of your favorite or a couple of your favorite teammates that you ever played with outside of me, you know. Well, <laughs> seven year the obvious one. Yeah. <laughs> um there's a, I mean there's a lot of good ones. Yeah. You know, you're just that's kind of what you miss most about the game when you're out is just your teammates and you know you're with them like every day they become like a, you're basically your family and um I mean I played 10 years with Cleveland and we just had tons of phenomenal teammates there and then I finished up uh with the Yankees so um that was really cool to be there and have a chance to play with Jeter and Mariano Rivera and Andy Pettit um and just those guys and see you know, the type of role models they are and the type of leaders they are. And um, that was just a great experience to, you know, just to be around those guys and learn from those guys. That's awesome. Yeah, I got to imagine, though, that's got to be a pretty awesome feeling uh, suiting up with the Yankee pinstripes on. I, I, I think that, you know, at least for me, I think that would have been always one team that I would have eventually liked to have played for you know, be it for a half a season or a year, just to say, hey, I got to wear the Yankees pinstripe. I think uh, they're just one of those iconic teams, you know? Yeah, and it's tough because that's kind of the one team that you always look forward to playing and you always wanted to beat when you're not with the Yankees. Um, <laughs> you kind of just learn to really dislike the Yankees and you want to beat them at all costs. And... Um, and all of a sudden you're looking at potentially joining them and it's like, man, how can I get over this? Like I just, I've learned to dislike this team so much, but um, it was really a great experience. Like you were talking about, it was, um, you know, like I guess growing up on a farm in North Dakota, like the thought of being in New York with 8 million people or whatever it is was a little intimidating, but you know, you kind of embrace it and it was phenomenal. You learn like where all the good restaurants are and, um, we really had a great year in New York and it was so much fun to play for the Yankees. And, um, it was, I mean, it's an experience we'll never forget. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, what do you think led to the success that you had in the big leagues? What's something that you can share with, you know, with kids and with parents and coaches right now that you think would help lead to those kids being a little bit better than they are today? Um, I would just say without a doubt, it was uh, work ethic. Um, like, I think it was just every day, um, what can I do to get better? But I mean, I just, I love to play baseball. Um, I watch baseball, like I was pretty consumed with it, but it, like, obviously in North Dakota, you're not playing it a ton, but 
Um, kind of my motto was I never wanted to look back and say, if only I had worked harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I, you telling me that all the time. Actually, actually it, it almost worked the reverse for me where I think I did so much stuff. Um, like I hit so much and worked out a lot and like I did so much stuff that it ultimately caused uh, shoulder problems. Mm -hmm. And that kind of was like the surgery that um, kind of really, um, I guess, kind of put a bit of a wrench in my career and it slowed me down quite a bit. But um, I think without the work that I put in, like I never would have even got to the point to have a chance to play in the big leagues. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. I think, you know, and it's work that you put in by yourself or with a coach. You, you know, I think I see a lot of kids these days, they, they go out and they hire their hitting coach or their pitching coach and they, they work an hour uh, or two hours a week and they think that they're good. And it's like, that's, that's not good enough. You know, you got to work. You got to get out there and work hard, man. You got to bust your butt. You got to be better than – you got to work harder than other people if you want to get to the top. So that's great to hear. Um, you, you know, what, so tell us a little bit about what are you doing now? Um, now that you're not playing baseball, um, you know, obviously I know what you're doing, but, but I think people would like to hear what you're doing now and how you're still staying involved with baseball. Um, right now I'm a special assistant with the Indians. Um, so I do – I do scouting. Um, I do a lot of scouting with hitters as far as uh, amateur Latin America hitters who are 15, 16 years old. I do uh, scouting for draft eligible hitters in high school and college. And then as far as like big league free agents and trade targets and stuff like that, I'll do scouting on video of all those guys. And then in spring training, I'll go out and work with hitters uh, during the season. I'll, travel around to some of the minor league affiliates and um, hang out with those clubs and just kind of be a resource for any hitters that want to talk hitting or mechanics or approach and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, what's, as you're scouting players, what's kind of one or two things that you're really looking for in, in a player? Um, so I like to watch their batting practice and I like to see their athleticism and their bat speed. Um, for me, that helps determine their potential. Like if, if a kid is athletic, he has a higher ceiling. Um, and if a kid has the more bat speed a kid has, you know, the more potential he has to be a better hitter. It don't always work out that way. Um, but I think that's why it's so important for kids to play multiple sports to develop athleticism. Yes. Because that, that helps you have more potential. And then I think, um, Mechanics, I think most mechanics can be corrected, but I mean, the things that I always preach are that a guy gets ready on time, he gets to a strong position to hit, and he's balanced. Like, I think those three things are the key to um, just three basic keys to a swing for me. Yeah, no, that's huge, man. I, I think I think sometimes, you know, we can overcomplicate hitting, and, and like you said, you know, you get through your three things, and then, you know, and the other part that you talked about is the athleticism that I really like. I think a lot of kids specialize in one specific thing at a young age, and they're not necessarily developing as an athlete, right? They're just kind of one-dimensional. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, to develop that ath athleticism. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a topic we could legitimately talk about for an hour. I mean, yeah. You see it more and more nowadays where kids are seven, eight, nine, ten years old and they're playing travel baseball or travel whatever, and they do it year round. Um, there's pressure from coaches that, you know, if you don't do like fall baseball, you don't have a spot on the team in the spring, you know, whatever. I mean, so you just, you're seeing kids make such a big commitment and they're playing year round in baseball. And, you know, by the time they're 11, 12 years old, they're burnt out. Yeah. Um, you know, so I always encourage kids to play multiple sports. Um, for example, if you're a soccer player or basketball player, that's going to help you be an infielder because your footwork's going to be better. Um, I think basketball is a great sport, just the running, the jumping, the plyometrics. It mm -hmm. carries over to baseball really well. Um, you know what? And, you know, for your kids too, if your kids are like 8, 10, 12 years old, it's good to like have seasons, play different sports, like make them miss the sport and then they're really excited to play it. 
yeah if you play baseball year round it's just kind of like it becomes a job but you know if you play baseball in your season and then you don't play it again until the next year like kids excited they can't wait to play baseball that's it man yeah i mean i remember playing all different sports and you know i didn't play baseball all year round and and you know I still made it and, and, you know, went to a good school. And, yeah, I, I'd love to see more kids just kind of play multiple sports and not just be so one-dimensional with, with just baseball or just whatever it is, hockey or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, a few more questions I, 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 I got for you, man. What, what is, uh, you know, what was your toughest pitcher you faced or who was your toughest pitcher you faced? I think it depended on the year. Um, uh, certain years, like the Cy Young winner had, you know, say like Zach Greinke, the year he won the Cy Young, like was incredible, like with his location and fastball and slider. And then, you know, you face him the next year and he's still one of the best pitchers, but he's not like the Cy Young guy. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say Mariano Rivera just consistently, like there really wasn't, anything you could do um, as a left-handed hitter unless you made a mistake. And he never really made a mistake with his location. Uh, his location was just so good that there wasn't anything you could do. Um, if you hit the ball hard, you pulled it fall. And if you hit it fair, it broke your back. <laughs> I know. I remember facing him a couple of times. I got I, – I remember playing in Yankee Stadium. He threw me one of his cutters that never really cut. And it just kind of sawed me off. But I, I – I hit it hard enough to get it right over the second base head. I got a single and two RBIs out of it. I was like, hey, thank you very much. Better than I ever did. Off the <laughs> um, what was your, what was like your, what was your favorite stadium to play in? Um, I really like Jacobs Field at Cleveland. Um, I like Safeco Field out in Seattle. Yeah, that's um, a great place. But there's actually like nowadays, I mean, there's so many new ballparks. They're all fun to go to. Yeah, uh, had an incredible atmosphere. Yankee Stadium had an incredible atmosphere. Um, Bush Park was like a little unique and different, and they're all pretty good. Yeah. Um, last question. Actually, two more. Two more. Th this one is: What's one kind of financial advice that you would give to uh, young players that maybe just signed their first big contract while playing? Uh, professional baseball or guys that are just getting drafted like what's what's a piece of advice that you're like you know what this is kind of something I, I stand behind yeah, so this is something that I'm like very passionate about because I made a lot of these mistakes um, I mean I, we could go down the list but essentially maybe, um, another, maybe another show we will it'd be another <laughs> show uh, don't buy too big of a house don't waste your money on like a, an expensive car um, I think I bought a car one time and then had to trade it in two years later with 10,000 miles and I got 40% of what I paid for it. And you, you just, I mean, you just really realize that a lot of these things you feel like you need as an athlete are just a complete waste of money. Like you'd be so much better off to just be practical and save money and just, you know, essentially you need to uh, make more than you spend. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but essentially just like, really think about your purchases and you know what's important what's not important and don't feel pressure to you know to have like the super high-end sports car to have like an extravagant home just make good financial decisions and i would surround yourself with a couple people um that you can ask and would tell you good advice not like hey man you need to go get that you know rolex watch like, like surround yourself with good people who can give you sound financial advice <laughs> uh yeah sorry we're we're laughing because we can see each other right here so we have a little funny joke there yeah i think that's i think that's big man I, I don't think there's enough sound people out there that give advice to kids to young players um that are speaking you know kind of speaking life and speaking wisdom and speaking from experience right it, the experience that you have is different from a financial advisor who never really went through making that amount of money at age 25 years old, right? A financial advisor, whatever, he probably made it when he was 40. So he's more mature. He's been through it. He's been through some things. Um, 
but it's tough as a young player, like you said, to, to know and to deal with that pressure. Oh man, I might be, I'm making 5 million or I'm making 10 million or whatever it may be. I, I can afford this house or I want to buy the Ferrari, you know, all these things. And, and like you said, that, that being practical, I think is um, a really good way of it, 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 you know, explaining it. Just be practical. Right. Like, yeah. And if, you know, you may be really excited to get the Ferrari, but it, it comes with some severe humble pie when you go to sell the Ferrari and you see what it's worth. Or, you know, when you go to sell the home and you keep having to drop the price of your home, like that's some serious humble pie. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. I mean, we, we've all, you know, and that's the thing I think, you know, we've all taken our nicks on the chin. I mean, I've you know, had deals that didn't work out and, and uh, it stinks, you know, it, it really, it, it stinks, but you know, the only way you got to learn from it and then hopefully we can share our experiences with other people. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we're doing these podcasts is eventually we'll get to the point where we can share our experiences with other players that will help them, you know, not make those mistakes, not make a six figure mistake or lose 50,000 or 10,000, whatever it may be, you know? So, um, last question I'd like to, I always like finishing with this. What's, what's, uh, one story that you could tell our listeners about me that was whatever, one thing you remember that was funny, stupid, whatever it may be, one thing about me. Hmm. It might be tough to pinpoint. Uh, one <laughs> like off the top of my head, like I know I'm going to like miss out on um, like the best ones that I can think of. I do remember you, I think you hit an opposite field home run off David Price on like a check swing one time. <laughs> You know, everybody was just like, how in the world did, did he just hit a check swing opposite field home run? I don't know if you remember that. It was in Jacob's field, but um, it was impressive. Um, and then I also think uh, in spring training when you set like the all-time Major League Baseball s'mores record, uh, eating the most. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one's going to go down in history. <laughs> I had way I had way in the next day too. Did it did it fare well for me? I feel I feel like I'm missing like the ten most obvious seven stories. Like like I'm just drawing a blank right now. I remember I I remember one time when Kerry Wood he took all my clothes and hung them up from like the ceiling for some reason. Um, when you're in spring training. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's good ones. We'll, we'll uh, next time we have you on the show, we'll, I'll uh, I'll make you think about them before. What did you have to dress up as? As like your rookie year, we had a rookie dress up. Yeah, I just so I dressed up. It's it's, it's probably I dressed up as a um, as a lifeguard, a, a woman lifeguard. So I do remember that. Yeah, you wore that well though, Seven. I'll give you yeah, that. You no. Know? I had, the, I had the junk in the trunk going on. So, you know, <laughs> I remember we, we were, God, we had a bad year that year. And, and Seggy, I think, was walking around with us. And he was like, he was hot. He's like, dude, what are we doing? We just got drum rolled out of here. And we're out here parading around these kids in the bars and stuff. Is that in Chicago? <laughs> no, it was in Boston. Okay. So we made the loop around the stadium going to each bar. Oh, my God. It was funny. It's kind of like one of those things is like, do we have fun? Do we not? We just got crushed. So, but whatever, man. It was all a good experience. <laughs> well, Travis, I really appreciate you being on the show, man. This was, uh, this was fun. Well, well, thanks for having me on, Seven. Uh, yeah. You're an animal. I appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, man. Good luck with the podcast. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. And we'll get you back on here again. We'll, we'll do some, uh, we'll start diving into some other stuff. And, and I think you got a lot of wisdom to share with, you know, with young players. So, all right. Well, have a good night. Thanks again.